we served uh, 4 million kids a year and we had 1200 organizations. So it's a French, it's like a franchise model or it's, it's, uh, it's called the Federation. So each like the boys and girls clubs of Metro Atlanta is its own nonprofit. So it actually is, it's, it's independent, but it has to hold to the chartering requirements of the national organization. So it's basically a federation of 1200 orgs and the national organization kind of controls the chartering components. So it's $2 billion soaking wet as a full organization, right? So it's just got a lot of scale. It's been around 160 years. Um, so there was, it was an, like it exceeded my expectations from a place to be like yeah. from a place to be and the impact and to see the kids that go through the programs right in the heart and right so, in the heart. Right and you, the heart. you know, we would have youth of the year, you know, so we, we would always have a youth of the year and we call it, it's not really a competition. It's just what, who is going to be named the boys and girls clubs youth of the year. They get to meet the president of the United States, et cetera. And so to hear these kids testimony, like, you know, I grew up, um, you know, my, um, my, my grandmother raised me. I had to take care of my younger sister. I didn't know what I was going to, you know, where I was going to find my next meal some days. And then after school, I got to go to the boys and girls clubs. I didn't have enough money to go. Somebody sponsored me to, to get me in there. And then you hear their testimony, like what the college preparatory programs that they went through and, and they're, and they're seniors in high school. And they say, and now I'm going to a Princeton university next year for biomedical engineering, you know, full ride. Oh, and like, oh, like something oh, insane, wow. right. To just hear testimony, testimony about how the boys and girls clubs, people believed in them. Welcome to the Small Business Safari, where I help guide you to avoid those traps, pitfalls, and dangers that lurk when navigating the wild world of small business ownership. I'll share those gold nuggets of information and invite guests to help accelerate your ascent to that mountaintop of success. It's a jungle out there, and I want to help you traverse through the levels of owning your own business that can get you bogged down and distract you from hitting your own personal and professional goals. So strap in, adventure team, and let's take a ride through the safari and get you to the mountaintop. Here we go again. Small business at Safari is ready to go. I can't even say my own thing. It's you're so excited. Safari. I am excited because we got <laughs> in studio. We're excited to have somebody. It's always our who favorite. I've known for a while. So uh, adventure team, uh, we don't get to talk much with somebody who really knows numbers inside and out. And we've got somebody today who knows numbers inside and out, upside down, every way you've ever had them before. And if you want them smothered, covered, smattered, black, they're all there. You can do them all. So we have Paul Sansone, Paul. <laughs> Is somebody that I've known for a number of years and got to meet through our kids uh, at a school here locally in Duluth, uh, Notre Dame Academy. Uh, they know they changed their names now. I think they're fighting wolfhounds, Irish hounds. Oh, the wolfhounds. Wolfhounds. Yeah, the wolfhounds. What did they used to be? Oh, we were the Irish. The Irish. Fighting Irish. Yeah, okay. I think, was that offensive? I, I guess that was. I don't. <laughs> I guess the Irish. <laughs> the, the Irish. Did not, we, had, the, we had to get rid of. Was like, it the, the drunken Jack, Irish? Right? <laughs> Right, I know. Depending on the day, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, that's a good. That's a great story. So they started, uh, and I'm going to introduce Paul in a minute, but I've got to do this one. So Austin plays, uh, it plays football, eighth grade football. Uh, one of the first years they really actually get it going, and so we tailgate, and so we go to these games, and we were tailgating, and uh, we got one of those walk bys and uh and it was uh julie taruki gave us the look you're like oh no. uh, then, then took this a little too far you got the stare i got the, the stare, stare. <laughs> yep and, I, and uh and so julie taruki the principal of the uh, but we got it and said my daughter's always like she's so strict she is so strict i said but she really liked you and then i got that i was like oh she is so strict <laughs> you spent much of your life getting the stare though i, I got that and i got that yeah in fact we actually as our family we actually have her down so when we when somebody's in trouble, we say you are literally being offensive. <laughs> <laughs> so we so uh, she, take, I hope Julie isn't listening. Listen, listen. I know she's awesome. My yeah. my son's at the school there now. So yeah. Mr. Rookie, if you're listening, you're fantastic. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> so Chris, uh, not so much. But. Paul, yeah. <laughs> so Paul has had a, uh, an incredible career. He started off. Uh, now I don't remember where St. Francis was, but I know he was on. The yeah, Francis. Pennsylvania, St. Right. Francis, Pennsylvania. Yes, so, yes. So if you can play golf on a golf team in Pennsylvania, you know you're pretty hardy. You've got something going, right? Because you're able to <laughs> probably a pretty good stick too. Yeah, you got it. You're probably playing through mountains. You're definitely playing through snow, bro. Because I did that in Michigan. So. We had a lot of it. That's right. But then uh, he takes off. He does. He does what a lot of us did at that time back in the late '80s and '90s is that go off, work for a couple of years, and then go get that big powered, high powered MBA. And I said, you know, I'm going to do that too, except there's a problem. 
What was that, Chris? There's no way I can make it into it. But anyway, <laughs> so so then he goes to Duke. Uh, he goes to Duke University, gets an MBA, comes out, works for IBM, which is uh, near and dear to my heart because that's where my wife lived or worked for. <laughs> <I> lived, <laughs> lived, 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 lived. She's accurate. Yeah. She was, yeah, she was there for a long time, uh, but worked his way out, but then left the corporate world and started helping small business companies uh, get going and provide a CFO advice. One of the best ones, not a small business at all, was he actually took time to go work with the Boys and Girls Clubs, and we were going to get into this. So p- welcome, Paul Sansone, soothsayer of all finance. I was told there'd be no math today. Chris, uh, no, thanks a lot. Really appreciate you guys having yeah, me here. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Paul's nice drinking drink. cheer wine. There you go. I don't even know what that is. Really? And they got he got excited. Right out of North Carolina. So it's specifically for there. It's fantastic. What is it? It's like a cherry soda-ish. Like, I don't know. It's Dr. Pepper with cherry and something like that. that but it's really good. That sounds awful. It's excellent. It, it is excellent. <laughs> you know, I'll get you one. In okay. fact, you've just insulted all North Carolina. <laughs> I think we just got canceled in North Carolina, Alan. Good news is, uh, for everybody else, we're in 49 of the other states. So we got that going. And all 15 continents. And all huh, Chris? Chris. We are. We are. We're rocking all 15 continents. And pretty soon, we'll probably be in other worlds. Uh, yeah. Because I think we're going to conquer Mars and the moon. Uh, we're going to be on the rocket with Musk. Yeah, I think. Yep. He he did ask uh, if our podcast, if we could take some of that as ar- archives, archaeology. And I said, I'll let you know. Yeah. I'm look, super honored <laughs> look, to be look, intergalactic right now. Yeah. This is great. That's it. So there you go. So here we go. So, Paul, looking back on your career, uh, was this planned that you were going to, is this the arc that you wanted to go on and you, this is where you wanted to be? Uh, you had a pretty successful, not a pretty, you had an awesome successful run and then doing this. So take us through. Yeah. Our, so it kind of just stayed in my lane for a long time. Like even when I was at St. Francis, one of the things I did was they had a job like student government uh, CFO. And I was like, oh, that seems pretty interesting. I was 19 and I applied and I got that job. And I was like, this is very interesting to be able to manage finances of a large organization. So we had about $100,000 of student activities fees. So when you go to college and you pay your student activities fees, it goes to the the student government to to roll out programs and fun things to do on the weekends. And I, I was, so it was like basically a CFO in training. So when I was there, it was crazy because I was 19, I had the job, but I had a 38 year old work study student being my secretary. So it was my first chance to be like a manager <laughs> and be a CFO at the same time and like a very safe environment. So I thought this is cool. I need to go learn more and continue to grow. So I went into public accounting after college and work with Price Waterhouse. It used to be Price Waterhouse and Coopers and Libran, but I worked there for a couple of years and got my CPA. How many hours a week? Yeah. So my dad used to ask me what kind of company I worked for because I would be gone for months at a time. Like he would, like, what kind of company is this where you work 12 hours a day, seven days a week for months at a time? So, yeah. So depending on the season, it would be, you know, 60 days in a row, like in busy season. And then sun, summertime was kind of cool. So, but yeah, so I worked in New York city and got my taste of Manhattan and enjoyed it, but I had, a, I had decided I wanted to go back and get my MBA. So I was accepted at Duke's business school and went back to, to there for two years. And, and that was a great experience because it wasn't just the MBA and meeting people, but it was also the two best years in Duke basketball history when they had Bobby Hurley and Christian Leitner and Grant Hill and all these guys. So the two years I went, I was there for two national championships. I never saw a loss in the basketball team, a lot on the football side. So you're having to get used to it now, though. Yeah, no, a little bit. Yeah, so now it's in my blood, too. So it's like you just love Duke basketball because of that. And I know he's actually... The the post-Coach K is... I mean, this whole tournament has been weird. There's no North Carolina, no Duke, no... I mean, no Kentucky... Anything. Well, right. you know, you could argue after this one, UConn is now blue blood. Somebody said, oh, yeah. UConn, you know, that's, the, that's their fifth. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So they're, they're yeah. right there with all the best, right? Yeah. So it's just a, but, but it was, it was, uh, it was definitely March Madness. Yeah. Oh, so so St. Francis, right, is in the same conference as Fairleigh Dickinson. So Fairleigh Dickinson beat St. Francis to make it to the tournament. And, oh, then, and then they beat Purdue. Wow. Right. So this is the like, so we're like, you know, division one basketball. We've been there for a long time. So it's just a cool to see the little guys strike up. It is so cool. It's a great tournament. And uh, it's awesome that you went to Duke. But when you you made that move, you're you're in New York. You're you're a young man. You're you're living the life uh, when you weren't working. Right. You had. Yeah. Everybody says that's a great place to be when you're a young in young person. Twenty. Yeah. Making a lot of money. And then you went to, I'm not going to make any money for two years. Yeah, no, it was, it was a, it was a little bit of a risk, but I was like, you know, the investment in myself is a big thing. I would, I would tell people, you know, always invest in yourself. That's going to be a payback for the rest of your life. 
and Gold so nugget. right so so yeah, okay. invest in yourself right so i looked at it as two years 17 or 18 months of just out of the workforce but uh, i just thought you know this is going to pay dividends down the road and it wasn't even just the school right the education was great but it's the network. It's the people yeah. that you're with. Duke MBA opens a few doors. I it, imagine. it does, but it's even like my, the people that I went to school with are now my board of directors. Like, wow. so when I am 30 years of, Hey, I've got this opportunity. Let me bounce something off you. Like the boys and girls clubs is looking for a CFO and I'm not sure. You know, I've never done nothing. And I'm like, Oh, that sounds like you, you need to go explore that. So you get your own personal board of directors with the folks that you went to school with and you have this trust and affinity with. So it's just, it just was a really good experience. And these people have been in my life now for a really long time. That is huge. Talk about maximizing your investment in your education and, and building you a yourself and build your network. And you know, yeah. Paul has talked about three things that we talk about quite a bit here that you got to take away, invest in yourself, bet on yourself. We've talked about that. Mm -hmm. Build your network. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and if you're going to go to school, and we've talked about this, I don't think everybody needs to go to school. You know, I don't yeah. think school's for everybody unless you're going to build and do what, what Paul did when he went and out to wait on his way to Duke. So I love that. that he's even talking about using these guys 30 years later. And I love that it, he's got he's got the ability to go back to these people and bounce things off of them. They have a center there. I, Ten years ago, I went back and and met with some of the professors. I'm like, how do I get back? Like, you know, I've just had an amazing experience. So they have a center for social enterprise that they started about 20 years ago at Duke. So I'm now actually on the board of the Center for Social Enterprise at Duke. So we just had a board meeting last week. And these people are just amazing. The board that they've got. Not a lot of Duke alums, actually. So we had some CEO of the Gates Foundation, CEO of Habitat for Humanity, Jonathan Reckford, who lives in Atlanta. Uh, just an amazing group of people. So you're there and you're just like immersed in this experience for a, a day or two at a time. And it's just, wow, these people are the sharpest people you ever meet. So uh, you, you you take off and you, you start working at IBM and then mm -hmm. eventually at Cisco here in Atlanta. And mm -hmm. That's what probably brought you to Atlanta, I'm sure. Yeah. So the leap into the small business world, talk about that. Yeah, it was really interesting. We When I came to Atlanta, actually, I started with Scientific Atlanta. So we were um, a billion-dollar company based here in, in um, at Metro Atlanta and sold into the cable systems. Mostly the cable companies were our, were our customers. So Cisco ended up buying us. After we grew from one to three billion. Cisco bought us in 2006. So I became a divisional CFO of Cisco for a couple of years. And at that point, uh, there was a road for me to become CFO of Scientific Atlanta over some time, right? So I was like, I could see it, right? right. But when you're with Cisco, I've got to relocate to San Jose, California, where they're headquartered. And we just, my my wife, our kids were planting roots. It's we just want we just loved Atlanta too much, quite honestly. We love being here. So this wasn't a, this wasn't a pl th this was a family move. This was not a uh, Paul Sansone career move. This was stay stay local, right? Yeah. So so decide you know if we we're going to go out to San Jose, then everything changes. So and our kids were getting geared up in school. They're going to start at Marist, right? So we stayed here, and I got an offer to become CFO of an e-commerce company called Better World Books, which was based in Alpharetta at the time and sold books and media on the internet. And I remember, this is another thing, you know, at the time when I was like- was that? So that was, so I started with Better World Books in 2008. I moved to Atlanta in 1998. So about 11 years, I was at Scientific Atlanta slash Cisco. Were they kind of cutting edge? So they were So they were a little bit like Amazon in the early days. So so Bezos knew about the company, right? So, but the way, the, the, the twist was that, that there was a social component of this for-profit. It, it was a one of the founding B corporations. If you ever Google that B corporation movement or B corporation.net, it's a social enterprise. So it's for profit, for good. It actually has a social mission to it. Hmm. And so their social mission was to fight illiteracy. And so every book that they sold, a percentage of the proceeds went to a literacy partner. And so I found that fascinating that you were combining the good things of business with the good things of doing a social purpose. Smack in the face to people that think corporate America is all evil. Yeah, yeah. That, this one's pretty big. <clears throat> yeah. In fact, I think I got one of the free books. I, I didn't know it at the time, but I they, they thought were you needed here, to learn how to read your literacy. No, but, yeah. <laughs> but it worked. It worked. It, 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 learn it, how to read. It, good. it, it worked ish. I, I read good. <laughs> Engineer start business. I make fire. I business. I read book. So that's actually when I had met Paul as he was working for this, and it was called Better Books. And yeah, I remember him telling me this. And and to be honest, I wasn't grasping the entire concept because an eight. 
So, uh, of course, when I started my business, of course, at, when the recession hit and, and nobody worked on their houses anymore, beautiful time to start a business. But that's a different podcast. We <laughs> talked about I'm with you. I was a customer. I was an early yeah, customer. He was. And so <laughs> that's true. So he went to work at this at this company. Better World Books. Yeah. Better World Books. And, yeah. But, but their mission, if you listen to it, it's just actually there's a brand exercise right there. How about a how about a different name? Yeah. But anyway, yeah. But you did it. So yeah. you went there not to be their brand ambassador. Right. You went into and you bought into their 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 thought process and everything they were doing. So it, you know, they, they really combined the mission component, but it had shareholders, it had a series A financing round. That was the reason I was brought in as CFO in the term sheet. The investors said, Go find yourself a CFO. If we're gonna give you this amount of money, you need to to beef up your executive team. So I started there in 2008. It was about 15 million of revenue at the time. I worked there for six years. We grew it to about 60, 65 million in revenue wow. over that time. So, and the funny, the, the the interesting thing about it was that how did they got their books basically donated by literacy partners? So they would go to libraries who had problems. Gwinnett County was the first customer. So the the Gwinnett County Public Library System weeds and feeds 50,000 books a year out of their system. Hmm. And they don't have a place to put them really other than recycle. And so we had a commercial reason to resell those books through the internet. We said, there's value here, but you're not a distribution and shipping and logistics company. That's what we do. So Gwinnett County would basically consign all of their books to Better World. Better World became then titled the books. So we it was our inventory. We posted them on 50 marketplaces every day and people could buy that book in 250 countries around the world. So we would, and then that's how a percentage of the sale would go back to Gwinnett library system as Beautiful. part. So this was kind of this really cool model of give us your excess books. We'll put them up online. We'll sell them on Amazon, betterworldbooks.com. And literally the genius was the guy, the, the founders were software experts. So they wrote the code to say, we can co-sell the same title on 50 marketplaces at the same time. And that was the genius part of it was the tech. Well, it's it was super genius. You made money that did good for the library, but also made yeah. you money for something that's going to go into a land. Yes. So we, yeah. we would process. Uh, so we had about, when, at the height, we were doing about 25,000 shipments a day. But think of containers of, tr of trucks, truckload, 18 wheelers of books coming in, right? So they had to be processed. So they would come in and we would scan the ISBN and that instantaneous would tell the scanner, the data would basically be three flavors. Keep the book, we can sell this because we can make money off this book. Two was uh, probably can't sell it, but we have 50 literacy partners that want this title. So put it over in this other bin to be donated. And the third one was if not A or B, we'll go to a recycling partner because we had national recycling contracts because we had so much paper. So no matter what, that book was going to be at a better place, and you you could sell to recyclers. Yeah, so we would actually make so, we yeah. would make paid we were paid a little bit on the tonnage, right? Yeah. So and paper yeah. paper markets go up and down, but we yeah. could get some. But it wasn't like you were burning the books. No, right? no, no. We couldn't co cost. Nice, uh, right? nice. I think it's still too soon to say that, Chris. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is it really? I mean, it's been like well, 100 years. I mean, it's been over 100 years. Not yet. No, I can't even do that. No, but we, I, we do happen to have a CFO here. Oh, that's right. Have, yeah. have, yeah. right. All right. So, so they're recycling, but you actually, but that's the thing. It's like scrap, they're like scrap metal right now. Oh, yeah. You know, just, just a quick aside. I was in Home Depot today. I'm training one of my new sales guys. I go over and I said, I wanted to show him how much Romex is now just to get him a feel for how prices have changed. They have cage over all the Romex now. Oh, God. Wow. Yeah, there's wow. a cage in Home Depot because you can't just buy just right. Romex. You stick a Romex under your shirt or what? I know, that, I was, I, actually, wow. It's funny you, was, funny you should say that because I, I actually was walking out going, I wonder if I wore like a skirt in. <laughs> and I walked out and I had a hoop skirt. Uh, it's like, a car. I would pay to see that. It's a gray market for Romex. I didn't know, but who knew? Who knew? Uh, sorry. So back to the uh, better bit. And anyway, better world so, books. So we ended up selling books. So again, we grew, but it, the, the thing was, during the recession of you know 2008 2009 it was a cheap way to get entertainment or to get so we started we blew up you know we got bigger and bigger during those during those tight years and continued to grow and so we would and the guys would write code and say hey we can turn on another are, are you saying that people read more during a recession they do right so they read but here's the deal they read used books <laughs> you know for 399 
Right. As opposed to the pool, right. Instead but, of going to going to somewhere else and buying it. Right. I so, love America. Right. I just want to go on record. Come on. Isn't that the best? <laughs> Maybe not so much North Carolina because of the cheer wine, but the rest of America, the other hey, 49 you states know what? are North awesome. Carolina. Please, when you put the bounty on his head, just remember, don't take me out. I live there too. I still have a place there. I go back all the time. I love it. Quit sucking up. All I right. love the barbecue. It's a wonderful state. Good barbecue, but good yeah. soda. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, anyway, so, so back to the. Book. So was there? Was there for six years? We we grew it, and then, uh, then one of the sequential CEOs said, "I think we should combine." Our distribution center was in Indiana, and so our offices were in Alpharetta, and so he said, "I think we need to put the home office with the distribution center and combine it." And so we had a few people move up, but then another choice was given to me about, "Hey." This is now relocating to Indiana, where the distribution center was. Again, love it. Like I could have been in San Jose. Yeah, you know, I could have been. I know. I know. So it's either South Bend or San Jose, and so I continue to choose Atlanta. <laughs> and I and today, yeah, and Atlanta I just want, I want yeah. Indiana to know our right. listeners that uh, no. Chris held his nose. You know, I look. It, Hey, if I'm going to lose a state, you're losing a state. Damn it. Well, what's What's interesting is that, what each, well, that's my son is at Purdue now, so I'm up there anyway. It doesn't really matter. I'm back in Indiana. So, you know, one of the things consistently that I've heard from Paul since you moved here in what year? 98. Yeah. yeah 90. So he is actually for the A. Yeah. The, oh, he, yeah. He yeah, yeah. 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 For the A. Yeah. So he's up there with with uh, Ludacris. He's up there with yeah. Big Boy. Chipper. Chipper. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Whatever it is. Yeah, when I look at Paul, yeah. <laughs> let's, let's identify with who you are. Yeah. <laughs> I'm talking about the rap scene. Yeah, that's it. Talk about the rap scene. I am for the A. <laughs> for the A. Anyway. Um, so, this is this is the funnest <laughs> podcast. Peace up, A down. Let's go. <laughs> so there you go. So Paul picks again Atlanta. Atlanta yeah, and and while uh, I'm talking to one of my guys, so in my, I, I've noticed yeah, something. By the way, yeah, Paul's a better picker than you. <laughs> I just and I haven't known Paul, but 15, 20 minutes picker. You mean yeah, just, like he just makes better decisions? Oh, he's yeah. definitely made way better. Oh, all right. Let's let's go. Let let's review, shall we? Yes. Uh, let's. let's. Michigan Tech University. Where was that? Uh, north of where most Canadians live. Right. right. Number one. Right. N- number two. I could have gone to Georgia Tech, but I chose North Carolina, Charlotte, <laughs> fourth best engineering school in the world, and then me. And so I went to North Carolina, Charlotte. Yes. And so you want to keep talking about bad choices? I mean, my series of bad choices. I've literally only made a couple good ones. I got a wife and two great kids. Other than that, I screw up all the time. 2008. Hey, you know, I think I'm going to start this. Uh, he needs my business. What, what are you doing? I'm making a buku bucks at the bank, you know, and we're doing No, no, no. Skip that. I'm gone. <laughs> So, so that's why I bring the CFO on. So I, I, I need you got to surround yourself with smarter people. I, I need better friends. <laughs> that is the lesson to learn: is we'll surround yourself with people smarter than you, like Paul. Decision decision trees. We should have a whole podcast on just decision trees. We'll work with this now. So let's wait more of this, shall we? I, ah, I, this is where it went wrong. I, I love it. <laughs> I, I, I literally, I'm born. Yeah, that's where it went wrong. <laughs> you know, good decision was to hire Chris to do our bathroom, which is still like hey. phenomenal shape. Phenomenal shape. Thanks, buddy. I love that tile yeah. job. The whole thing you did was phenomenal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. It's been a long time. Yeah. Since then. So now, yeah. you know, last year alone, we did 120 uh, projects, and of those wow. 120, we did a, we did 65 bathrooms. Wow, that is yeah. amazing. Yeah, and then we did 2,000 handyman jobs on top of that. Holy cow! Yeah, I, he's, he's doing growth. my front doors, and I haven't paid him yet. <laughs> yeah, you know what? <laughs> don't, I, don't hold your breath. <laughs> right? I was like, I said, Should we I, talk I, about ARs, Paul? <laughs> yes, yeah. Hey, hey, CFO, I'm not good with numbers, but I'm, <laughs> I ordered his doors. I've actually paid for his doors, and I still don't have his check. And I'm sitting right next to him. And you know, the person who's giving me the most heat. It, it is my accounts receivable person. She goes, hey, is he going to pay or what? Is he going to pay or what? See, so on Chris's saying, side, you call that risk. And on Alan's side, you call that float. <laughs> so, so, we just learned something. <laughs> I'm floating, baby. Look at me. I'm just floating. So, you, you, if you can name it, you can tame it, right? Risk and float. <laughs> oh, my God. That's a CFO nugget right there. See, put that in a CFO conference and let's see those guys. Talk. I could just see, I could just see the conference right now. If you play that out, Paul, you go, you know what? Risk float. And, and everybody kind of gets the sugar. <laughs> oh, good. I got the room. They're rolling. What? They didn't laugh. Oh, that's how CFOs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Now you got a move. Uh, you got a move. Pinky up the mouth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who 
knew you could laugh at her. With the same oh, thing. we got hey, belly laughs. My, so my wife's an look. accountant, and I've got yeah. to just countless the most boring Christmas. Yeah, you terrible. Ever, right? Yeah, this yeah, is fun. Terrible. No, yeah. my wife's a CPA. My mother-in-law's a CPA. It can suck. Yeah, the light no, out of a room can, in a hurry. No, we are yeah. going to keep it light. We are going to keep okay. it fun. It's All a core right. value. Keep it fun. All right. Oh, I love this. All right, let's yeah. keep it going. Yeah, where, where the hell were we? Oh, uh, oh he, he I don't even remember. Hey. No, well, we were at we're books. Oh, Bet, Bet, Better World Books. But we, yeah, have we made it to the Boys and Girls Club yet? Not yet. No. We're going next. Oh, good. let's go there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so move the 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 corporate office up to Indiana was our, and I agreed with. Them. I actually think there was going to be a lot of synergy, so we had a few employees relocate. And I but it was a it, it, you agreed with them, but don't let the door hit you in the ass. No, the yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. They actually were like, hey. If there's a chance, I can go up there, and I've got a couple of good friends that are up in South. The South Bend is where the distribution center was, so Notre Dame country. But they yeah. moved up there, and they're still there. They love it. And so I was at the same time. I was talking to a guy in my network, a guy who used to work at Price Waterhouse. He's and he was a Boys and Girls Clubs alumni. And he said, "Do you know it's not out yet? But the Boys and Girls Club CFO is considering retiring. He's been there 25 years. And, and, it's and headquartered it's, here it, in Atlanta. Head, yeah, head, and so for uh, forever, it was headquartered in New York City." And what was great about Atlanta, again, for the A, so a lot, a real orchestrated movement right when we won the Olympics to get major nonprofits to move to Atlanta. Atlanta's one of the top philanthropic cities in the world. We give. People in Atlanta are generous. Really? So Coca-Cola got together with, with uh, SunTrust Bank, the Woodruff Foundation, and they basically got together and said, we need to move. We need to woo large nonprofits to Atlanta. So- Boys and Girls Clubs was headquartered across the street from the United Nations for dozens of 50 years or something like that. And they put a whole package together. Coca-Cola said, we're going to donate stock. The Woodruff Foundation said, we'll give you a grant and find you a building. And SunTrust said, and we'll, we'll help you finance it. And they literally got the Boys and Girls Clubs to relocate their headquarters That's to amazing. Atlanta. And amazing story. Yeah. Right across the street from the Woodruff Arts Center. And uh, yeah. That and, is amazing. Yeah. So, and that wasn't it, right? So, so if you think about it, like um, Habitat for Humanity is headquartered here. American Cancer Society is headquartered here. Yep. Um, Arthritis Foundation is headquartered here. Uh, points of Light is headquartered here. Salvation hey, Army. I've put, yeah. Just two points. Of yeah. Me. I've worked for the uh, American, uh, the cancer and the, what was the other one? Uh, arthritis or Points of Light or no, no uh, uh, Habitat. Yep. Yeah. Hey, Habitat's for you guys. Yeah. Perfect. CIOs. We don't actually. Yeah. Uh, but you they don't want us because we know what we're doing. They want they want to be able to tell people what to do. Oh, yeah. That makes yeah. sense. So they don't like us. That makes sense. Are you slamming so, Habitat? I mean, no, no, I love them, but they don't like us because uh, they, they they don't, they want because they, they're built for the unskilled labor with those guys to show. But you no, know, I've worked for the CIOs for both of those guys. I was going to say. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I was like, I'm in the room and it was the uh, American Kidney Foundation. You said that, right? Oh, no, no, I didn't say kidney. I said oh. cancer. Yeah. But, Can cancer. Yeah. We yeah, the American yeah. Cancer CIOs uh, yeah. house, and then it was another one. I was like, oh "My God, I'm working for all these CIOs uh, for, for yeah. the foundation." So I now I'm I'm tying it together. Yeah, like, this ah. was orchestrated by the by Atlanta, which is just a because it brought oh, it brought professional that? jobs and it brought it a mission to Atlanta. Um, it, like I said, leveraging the philanthropic part of the city, the Woodruff Foundation, I think, has seven billion dollars under management because mm. of the founders of Coke put a lot of their money into wow into giving back. There's so, a gold nugget right there. Yeah, that's really cool. I never, I never would have said that. Yeah, to else uh, that hey, look, I know we might have lost the Super Bowl, but uh, look, we got all these nonprofits. That is definitely so, too soon, <laughs> right? Way too soon. <laughs> so clearly, we are a nonprofit. We are totally givers. We gave New England another one. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> that's a harsh tie-in but yes yeah, it was i'm leaving hey, no. trust me hey, yeah no i know i know i'm falcons the for two weeks uh for, two weeks. The, for the a falcon season ticket holder brave season ticket holder whatever G, chick-fil-a peach bowl season ticket holder, whatever it is i'm in atlanta so i just i love loved, adopted yeah. the teams They're great. yep oh let's love it all right so back to the uh, yeah so and boys and girls Cubs job comes available i go interview and um and it was crazy because uh i, I went through 19 interviews to get that job are you what yeah Dude, what? yeah 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 and because this if you think about the cfo they were national, really on the fence for a long no, time you know what it was the ceo finally i said finally said in the last interview because i had an interview with the board members where they lived right so i had to you know fly for a week i flew five different cities to meet the board members chairman of the finance committee etc so i had to travel in addition to having the interviews on site and i finally asked the ceo why so many interviews he's like Paul, you know, your job might have more responsibility than my job because if we do something wrong at the Boys and Girls Clubs of America with national funding that we get, and are we on the front page of the Wall Street Journal? He's like, there's no going back, right? He's like, your job actually might have more 
outward stakeholder interest, right? Just from a federal funding and all the donations that we get and all the financial reporting and the integrity and the trust that's required for this role. So I remember the last interview coming back, fly, like flying every day, like going to Hartsfield in the morning, flying to Chicago, for example, where one of our board uh, members was, and then flying back and then rinse repeating the next day. So I'd fly again to Orlando and I'd fly to New York in one day, just to have lunch with these board members. Finally on Friday, the flight back, I had my head in my hands. I'm like, wow, this is brutal. <laughs> like, this is a lot. Right. But then at the end, when I came back the following week to talk to the CEO, that's he explained it to me. I'm like, you know, he's right. He's like, you have to trust this role. And they hadn't had a new CFO in 25 years. So. Oh, wow. How uh, about that? 25 years. Right. But for those who are listening, uh, that is truly uh, that what he just talked about, you know, the word, the term slog, the term just beat your head against the wall, because what people don't probably realize is that we live a good 40 minutes away from the airport on a good day with no traffic. Yeah. And so it wasn't just like, and if you've ever connected through Hartsfield, which my friends have, um, you, you know, it's a big airport. So mm -hmm. it's not a quick jaunt as it were, uh, you're not popping on. No, my rule you know. of thumb is I leave three hours before my flight. Yeah, so yeah that's yeah. From, from where so, where we are in the yeah. Northern Arc. You know, but, you got to get you but leave yourself right through the paces because, yeah. again, you think about this, the the money that you were holding and the trust you yeah. were holding and the, the kids that we all hold dear because, heaven forbid, you screw up a kid's life. Yeah, I mean, you are going. You're you're going to be taken down. And yeah. So they'd had the same CFO for 25 years, and so here mm -hmm. you came. Okay. Yeah. So wow. we we served uh, four million kids a year, and we had 1,200 organizations. So it's a franch. It's like a franchise model, or it's it's uh, it's called a federation. So each like the Boys and Girls Clubs of Metro Atlanta is its own nonprofit. So it actually is. It's it's independent, but it has to hold to the chartering requirements of the national organization. So. It's basically a federation of 1,200 orgs, and the national organization kind of controls the chartering component. So it's $2 billion soaking wet as a full organization, right? So it's just got a lot of scale. It's been around 160 years. Um, so there was, it was an, like, it exceeded my expectations from a place to be. Like, yeah. From a place to be and the impact and to see the kids that go through the programs right in the heart. And right so, in the heart. Right and you, heart. you know, we would have youth of the year, you know, so we, we would always have a youth of the year and we call it, it's not really a competition. It's just what, who is going to be named the boys and girls clubs youth of the year. They get to meet the president of the United States, et cetera. And so to hear these kids testimony, like, you know, I grew up, um, you know, my, um, my, my grandmother raised me. I had to take care of my younger sister. I didn't know what I was going to, you know, where I was going to find my next meal some days. And then after school, I got to go to the Boys and Girls Clubs. I didn't have enough money to go. Somebody sponsored me to, to get me in there. And then you hear their testimony, like what the college preparatory programs that they went through and and they're, and they're seniors in high school. And they say, and now I'm going to a Princeton University next year for biomedical engineering, you know, full ride. Oh, I like oh, like something oh, insane, wow. right? To just hear testimony, testimony about how the Boys and Girls Clubs, people believed in them and how the folks there are trained to know every kid by name. And when they come in and they say, hello, Chris, or hello, Joe, or hello, right? they are trained to, to build up the esteem in these kids and change their access. So is are the roots of, of this from the, I mean, if I'm doing my math right, it's the end of the Civil War. Yeah, so it's exactly right. So the, in Boston, I think it was, or somewhere in the, it was in the north, northeast quarter of Massachusetts, somewhere up there. And I forget the name of the first club, but a bunch of. A bunch of homemakers at the time saw young boys getting in trouble after school in a lot across the street. They would watch from their porch and the kids would get in trouble. They would break things and do things. And one of the moms said, come into my basement. We're going to have a club. Hmm. And that was the boys club. Wow. wow. And that was, I think, in Boston. And okay. so then the model started to scale. They're like, get these kids off the street from three to six give them something constructive to do in the afternoon. And so then there was also a girls club. Now that is now girls Inc because the boys club that started in the 1860s, I believe scaled up to like 1900 and they became a federation. That's when the boys and girls clubs of America was founded to cover all these individual clubs with chartering and branding and things like that. Um, but the net of it was a lot of the girls were coming to the clubs anyway. So they wanted to, brand it as the Boys and Girls Clubs of America, which they did, um, I think, in the 80s or 90s. 
So just an amazing impact. You know, how many club, I forget how many clubhouses there are. It's like 4,000 clubhouses. They're on military bases all over the world because it's American soil. So Colin Powell made a big push to put clubhouses on all the military bases. Mm. So the kids that are military uh, kids are, are going to boys and girls clubs at all these different locations. So it's just a cool American story about how to give growth and access to youth. And and you just see amazing stories. Jennifer Lopez learned how to dance at a boys and girls club. That's Denzel it. Washington learned how to act on a stage in a boys and girls clubs. <laughs> Shaquille O'Neal played basketball at a boys and girls club. I, I do right? know he's a big supporter, over, especially here in Atlanta. Over yeah. and over and over and over again. And then there's CEOs and CFOs and things like that. And one of my buddies who I, was the one I called is he's in the Hall of Fame because he was C COO of McCann Worldwide and came out of the boys and girls clubs. And he, and, uh, he was the one who told me about the role. So just an amazing organization. It totally exceeds your expectations. Wow. Talk about uh, the arc there. So, so you're not there now. Yeah. Uh, is, yeah. What yeah. are you doing now? Yeah. So I was at the boys and girls clubs about three years. And uh, a lot of the executives at Scientific Atlanta slash Cisco, where I worked, were at a firm called Tech CXO. Four of them became partners in this firm at Tech CXO, which is founded in Atlanta. And it's an amazing consulting organization that basically does fractional C-level services for small and medium-sized businesses. So zero to $50 million of revenue. I was their CFO. These guys were marketers, technology guys, chief information officers. And so they started calling me and basically saying, you need to be in this firm, mm. right? Because you were our CFO. You need to help other scaled companies. And so I was like, I like the Boys and Girls Clubs. It's an amazing mission. At the same time, I was starting to get really into some of the administration of Boys and Girls Clubs. For that role, there's a lot of governmental audits and a lot of things that I wanted to take out cost and, and operate the Boys and Girls Clubs of America better from, a, you know, from an efficiency standpoint. But I didn't have a lot of time to do that because we had a lot of administrative work to do. So I'm like, I want to really help organizations scale. And so... I, it's not that I wanted to leave the Boys and Girls Clubs. I actually wanted to go to Tech CXO because I thought I could make a bigger impact on a lot of different organizations at once. So I was at the Boys and Girls Clubs for about three years. And then in 2017, I made the move to come to Tech CXO. After and 25 years and you there for three, they must have been crushed. They Well, you know, like we got I mean, 19 you, more interviews. Yeah, you're, you're I know, not, right? Yeah, yeah, but they're not. They're, I mean, you're not allowed to say this because that would mean you're full of yourself. I get it. But. They must have been like, no, Paul, please, please don't do this. Now, you know, like I, and I told the CEO, I said, I'm a good fit for you, but I want to find a great fit for you. I said, my successor is going to be a great fit for you. And the reason I'm not a great fit is because I want to take out hundreds of millions of dollars of two billions of dollars so more kids can get served. But I have 85 committee members that are on all these six, I have six different committees that I run as a CFO. So every week I'm doing a new committee meeting, very administrative is the role. And it has to be. They needed a more, they needed and someone. And it's hard to say that's personally gratifying. Yeah. To go to meeting. Meeting after meeting. meeting yeah. And, and the folks there are amazing. The board members are the, you know, the, 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 the who's who of America. But I wanted to operate. That's yeah. as a CF, as an operating CFO who had, who had been at e-commerce and had been in scientific Atlanta. And, and I had really wanted to operate. So I, so tech CXO was like, the interview started with, what do you like to do? Or it was the first interview. I never had a job description pushed across and said, here's what you have to do. They mm -hmm. said, what do you like to do? I said, I like to help operate companies. I like to grow and scale companies. And when they, 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 they I was like, this is the weirdest interview ever. I go, you just told, asked me what I wanted, you know, what, I, what, what do I like to do? great question, right? Chris, what? what? Did you write that down? You know, hang on, actually, you know what? Here, you wanna know my interview questions? Cause I just got a, uh, hey, great question. So I just interviewed new sales guys and uh, one of them started. And uh, of course he told me this. Actually, uh, I've had other people tell me that I did not pick. I said, number one, I said, I got three questions for you now, right? Great interview. Yeah. Just in today's world, trying to hire home service salespeople yeah. is really hard. Very hard. Not yeah. exactly hiring CFO level. People, right. You know what I'm saying? Right. So we're in. So I end with this. I'm like, all right, number one, give me your favorite movie. Yeah. And so, that, so you know what? All right, give me your favorite movie. Go. Shawshank Redemption. Go. Fletch. Nice. All right. Favorite music. Uh, God. Blues. Van Halen. All right. I'm going to go with you for the last one. <laughs> nice, Van Halen. <laughs> Come on. I got the blues. I have Stevie Ray Vaughan for me. So anyway, favorite comedian? Oh, uh, oh God. Um, Sebastian Maniscalco. Oh, I don't even know who that is. I do. 
He is. I, tell you, tell YouTube. Me you know why you don't? Because you're not. You know what? What? You're, you're prejudiced. Against <laughs> <laughs> we, we still is he from this. North Carolina? Huh? <laughs> no, he's from <laughs> Chicago. He's, in, he's Sicilian, actually. He's, he's Sicilian. It's Italian. Yeah, he's a great yeah, I'm going to be great. sleeping with the fishes, aren't yeah. I? Yeah, he's fantastic. That's all right. He married a Jewish girl. <laughs> you're missing Passover. He's not, and Al is not even Jewish, by the way. No, but I wormed my way into a Passover last year, and I was super excited because <laughs> food. I mean, favorite like, comedian answer. I'll tell you one that just makes me laugh my ass off is uh, Mitch Hedberg. He is phenomenal. Wow, he got me on it. Yeah, he's good. He, yeah. So I asked these three questions to see if they're sales guys. They need to be able to pop it right. Yeah, and I want to yeah. hear what they're going to say. Yeah. Because <clears throat> if they waffle and say, mm, it depends, or, uh, 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 yeah, or, or, right. And so, if, by the way, nobody said Godfather, and that, that's mine. So, uh, just, to, just to that's good. Up. We should ask you, what's Thank your you. music? You said, you uh, said G. Gray Vaughn is my favorite artist ever. So, blues rock, blues is, rock. Yeah. And, uh, favorite comedian. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, Sebastian, that's a great one. Uh, but that would not have been my, my, my favorite. My favorite's Ron White. He's amazing too. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and I love it because I love how he how it happens. So Ron White has got the best delivery oh, yeah. and timing, and the fact that you know that Jeff Fox, whether he was a huge Christian man who has a Bible study, but it's Ron White and says I see so much in Ron White, who is the most vulgar comedian I've ever heard in my life talk, and I'm trying to do what he does with it. And I actually took my wife to him. And my wife can't stand it when I even say the f word. And you right. know, you took your wife to Ron White. I did, <laughs> and she came back yeah. and she says I liked it. I'm like. Oh. You want yeah. a funny story on Jeff Foxworthy? Because he lives here, right? He did. So he yeah, yeah. So my buddy's behind him at Publix, you know, over here in in, in Johns Creek. Yeah. And right. he's in the, the the 10 item or less line. And and Foxworthy's got like 20 things. And and he turns back to my buddy and says something like, ah, I'm sorry. I just I know I got more things and I just but I gotta I'm late for something. And my buddy stands there and goes, if you have 14 items in a 10 <laughs> item checkout line, you might be a redneck. <laughs> and he started cracking up. <laughs> I love that. So anyway, so all right, but going back sense to the of humor. question. So so you're asked that question. What's a great doing? question? No. We're gonna have to listen to the tape. What? Are you claiming a great question? <laughs> <laughs> I, I gave you guys three great ones. I actually those are good questions. Those are great things I, to I, use I, in an interview. That's yeah, why I, I like that. that out to everybody oh, because okay. I like that. That kind of great. You question. use that and yeah. What, what uh, so the guy I ended up hiring, I did have one of the guys. Uh, we said, you know what, you weren't one. You're not our pick, but you're one B man. Stay, stay tight. We're going to come back. We'll probably pick you up in the mm -hmm. fall. As it turns out, we're probably going to pick him about a month. Um, but I'm riding around with my new guy, and he said, you know, Chris, I actually was playing. Uh, your questions back to my buddies because I've never had anybody do that to me. And it really made me think. Very cool. And one of the things, the reasons we took him is because, well, he answered correctly. No, but he was, <laughs> he, uh, he, yeah. he, he, bang, bang, bang. He didn't wait. Yeah. You know, he said, he said, Chris Farley, he said rock. And he said, uh, I can't remember the movie now. It was good though. It was a good movie. Very so, cool. Yeah. Just, you got to have that answer, right? You got to be ready. But I wanted to know oh, yeah. if I'm going to ride with you for seven hours a day, teaching you how to sell home services and, remodeling and handyman stuff i want to know i'm going to like hanging with you because if you would have told me bach and my favorite movie is uh you know i, I I'll pick a really bad one i don't know uh, 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 musicals <laughs> yeah right <laughs> oh, all of Oklahoma. them <laughs> all of them i mean I just, musicals now i just now i just got canceled by everybody who likes musicals <laughs> i mean not one musical no no offense you, you don't like sound of music all. I do. Okay. You're, I like, I was like going to say, you're, I did you're like a communist. <laughs> I'm not burning books. Yeah. Did they burn books? I don't know. Who, who burned books? It wasn't, no. it was the Nazis. Nazis. Oh, oh, that's yeah. terrible. But, but then weren't they after the, weren't the Nazis after them? They were chasing Maria and her, you know, yeah. the family. Yeah. Right. So they're the book burners. Right. Which Paul, as we've established, was not. He was no, a book recycler. A book recycler. recycler. <laughs> better outcomes. Better outcomes. <laughs> For better outcomes. <laughs> All right. So you went back to these guys. And, I, and this is where, and we're running out of time too. God, I love this. Yeah. You, you feel like this is, a, and you know, you have to, you won't say it. I'll say it for you. The administration stuff of corporate America can really be a drag. And if it's actually government related, even harder to break through. Yeah. So some of the things, like you said, you can find someone who really enjoys the the compliance components. There are people out there that, 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 that are super professionals and can love it. But if you're an operator of a company, you, you want to operate. 
Yeah. So anyway, it's not amazing organization. Uh, I loved my time there and I still love the organization, but tech CXO has been a great fit for me. It's been six years. Uh, we help small and medium enterprises, zero to $50 million of revenue scale up with fractional services. So if you need a CFO, you can get us for a day a week instead of five days a week. And it's way more efficient. All right. So uh, Tech CXO, uh, where are you guys servicing companies? And yeah. Can, where, where can they find you? Yeah. So tech, where, where do they have to be? So they can be anywhere. Okay. So we're at, uh, te- it's a virtual firm. We've been in business for 20 years. We were founded in Atlanta as Tech CFO. And then after 10 years, we're, we basically said it's not just a CFO model. It can be a chief marketing officer model, a chief human resources officer model. And zero to $50 million, you might not be able to afford a full-time CFO or CHRO or whatever it is because you just don't have all that work. But you have those issues, right? You have a few of those issues that need to be taken care of. So we are in now uh, founded in Atlanta with a few partners. We are now over 100 partners. We have 250 staff. We're in 12 major markets in the US, New York, Boston, Chicago, Carolinas, Florida. and But we can serve companies virtually. So I have clients in Los Angeles. I have clients in... Alabama, I have clients in Florida, I have clients in South Carolina. So we can serve virtually, we can travel as required, but basically we're there to be the best business partner, you know, the entrepreneur has because we can give them an independent look. We can also, we're all experienced. So to, the brand promises to be in as a partner, you have had to have been in the seat as a CXO in your career. So that vetting is done by the firm and every client we have, we have about 1500 clients. The company has been around for, firm's been around for 20 years. I forget the number of exits we've done. So scaling up these companies to sell, but I think it's up to $7 billion or something crazy. So just taking organizations and and, and scaling them up is what we like to do. I love that. Um, and I was going to make a snide comment until I realized that a lot of uh, tech companies do this, but you keep saying zero to 50. I'm like, well, zero is um, not in business. Yeah, um, right. Which, but- um, by the way, that was me for uh, 16 months. <laughs> Yeah, right. I, guess, I, mean, I had revenue. I had no profit. Right. right <laughs> Overnight right. success. 15 years later. Yeah, exactly. Very. All right. So, but, but zero dollars of revenue, like, well, you're really not. Really yeah. Happy, but, uh, but you're, you know, there's, you got to start somewhere and, and you yeah. might have people that believe in you and you might have funding and you might need to figure out a strategy to get to where your vision is scaled. And so, most of our clients have scaled some. So, but we have got, you know, a few startups that we work with. And, uh, you know, we've had, we've, We've had a lot of success in technology in Atlanta. That's awesome. I uh, So Tech CXO, we'll put this in the show notes uh, if you want to go out there and find it. Um, we didn't dive into everything CFO, but I think you get a flavor that uh, Paul is a little bit different than most CFOs because um, you pick, figured out a couple things. And if you didn't figure this out, Paul actually loves his family. And a lot of his decisions weren't really based on Atlanta. It was based on his family. Uh, he's a huge family man. I was telling Alan before uh, Paul got here, he said, I actually got to see him coach softball while I was coaching softball at the same time. I said I was a passionate softball coach. Um, Meaning you screamed a lot. Animated softball coach. Let me finish. Okay. Uh, yes. I, That's going to slap uh, yes, my tires, Paul. I said I used to see Paul over there with calm demeanor, just talking to the girls and, and coaching them up and then absolutely kicking the shit out of us. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so back to bad license sessions. Uh, uh, but don't worry, I've been in counseling since then. So we've talked about that. Uh, so that's uh, that's helped me a lot. Win without boasting, lose without excuse. That's that's the goal, right? Nice. There, there you go. There you go. There's another nugget for you, Paul. <laughs> I can't let you leave without asking four questions that we ask everybody. Yes. Get here. Give us a book that you would recommend that we all read. So there's a really cool book, and I guess it's interesting. I got it in, introduced to me at the Duke uh, Case Advisory Board. The author is uh, one of the authors is a guy named Dan Heath, co-wrote it with his brother, and it's called The Power of Moments. And so he is uh, they're both his brother work is a professor at Stanford. He's a professor at Duke, and they looked at companies and said, you know, companies measure themselves by plans, but people measure their lives by moments, right? So what impacts them in a moment? And so they took about 10 different vignettes about how to do certain things best in breed of all these companies or organizations or anything that had a powerful moment that changed a person's life. So one of the companies is Motley Fool and they do onboarding very differently. You start on a Friday, you 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 pull a like an individual advance form that says, tell me about you. So if you're like from New Orleans, they might put Cafe Du Monde baking powder on your desk when you get there. They might give you a Saints jersey with your name on it over your chair. They want you to feel at home as soon as you walk in, and they basically have this whole day planned out for you. And at the end of the day, you meet the CEO, and he gives you a $500 gift card and says, go have dinner with your family this weekend on us. 
And so what do you think those people are talking about all weekend, right? What do you think they're doing on Monday morning? They are charged up mm. to be part of the team. And so the book captures all these moments that organizations and companies do to change lives. And it's just a pretty amazing book. And you read, it's an easy read and it's cool because it's different vignettes, but I would heavily recommend it. Nice. I love that one. Wow. I think That's I know a it. good question that we're asking now, isn't it, Chris? All right. Yeah. That one made me ask that because he didn't like my other ones, but this one. But is... you burn books. So that's obviously why we didn't get to. <laughs> oh, oh, I thought... I... oh, wait, I'm sorry. <laughs> Actually, no, I thought we, I thought we established I could barely read a book. That, that's why I'm using <laughs> audio books and I can only watch. I actually, uh, if they ban TikTok, I probably won't be able to leak at anything anymore because TikTok is exactly my attention span. 15 <laughs> seconds. And they Which said, explains why you hire people based on whether or not you like the same movie they do. Right. Well, it, yeah. not the same movie. They got to have the answer. But if they say the wrong movie, you're done. <laughs> so that's a, it is a filter. Good for you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, at least you have. All right. Uh, number two. I say, by the way, I got it right this time. Um, give us the favorite feature of your home. And we already established this the trusted toolbox. Wow. Bathroom, but well, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say that's really far and away the, the trusted toolbox bathroom. But I would say <laughs> since that point, um, we put on like a living space out in the backyard, like kind of like a patio with a gazebo and a flat screen and couches and just a comfortable place to hang out and a nine month room, kind of I call yeah. it with my wife. It's the nine month room. So, I like it. So, and we did it all like on the cheap and got my buddy to draw up the plans and got buddy to pour the cement and went to Costco and bought a gazebo and just, so, but it's really fun to have everybody out there. It's That's cool. cool. Yeah, yeah. it's great. Yep. So we love customer service out here because we are customer, customer service, service freaks. <laughs> and look at that. We did it. I, I changed it up on you this time. I know. So when you're out there. See how quick I was? Yeah. You did. Right. You'd hire me. You know, almost. Uh, but you're out there working and getting service. You're getting the product. You're getting the service. You're, you're grabbing food. You're grabbing whatever it may be out yeah. there. What is a customer service pet peeve of yours? Uh, you, you know, uh Probably responsiveness is kind of just a, a lot of things can be solved if you're just responsive, even if you just human to human say, I got your email or I got your text or I got your voicemail. I'll get back to you if I don't have the answer. You can take away 50% of the angst. Mm, that is and, a great and, point. And, and so we, we're always trying to coach responsiveness within our within everything we do, right? So time kills all deals, man. So if you're just responsive to somebody human to human and give them the respect they deserve, just like you'd want to be treated. I went to like my little guy with spring break. We went to a fast food burger place he loves. I mean, I sat at that counter. like they, It wasn't like a, I existed for seven or eight minutes just standing there. And I just thought, I think I might walk out. But, mm -hmm. you know, I respect them because they're under a lot of pressure and not a lot of people probably. But Man, it could have been great if she just came out and said, "Hey, I will be there in one second. Yeah, right? that's I, all she had to I, say. All right? she had to say, "I'll be there in one second." She didn't. Right. So that just being responsive, I think, is really if you can if you be responsive, you take away a lot of the angst. Yeah, let them know that they're most important people there, and that we're going to get to you. I just can't get to you right now. It's not a you. you got it. It's a me thing. Look at the gold nuggets from Paul. Paul's dropping them. CFO, look at that. I know. All right. Wow. Time kills deals. All right. <laughs> I'm yeah. Actually. I didn't write that down because I was so focused on getting the third one out. Um, <laughs> this is the best podcast I've ever done. Uh, this is amazing. It is. It it is. is. The only, have you ever done in a podcast? Yeah, I've done oh, like okay. two others. So like I feel oh, like top three. two. Yeah, a lot. Top three. No, a lot. Top three. I've done, I do one with my wife every night, but we don't record it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> All right. On that All note. Right. All, right, okay. keep going. All right. Last question. <laughs> Give us a DIY nightmare story that doesn't involve a Costco gazebo. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, well, let's not go there. <laughs> so I worked for Scientific Atlanta, moved to Atlanta. The house we bought, the previous owners only been there a year, but they got direct TV. So I'm a cable guy now. So I'm like, Robin, tell my wife, we've got to get cable because I got to learn about the products. I got to learn about what we do on set tops. I got to learn about all this stuff. So we call Media One, come out and drop the cable. And so they proceed to like ruin our entire sprinkler system. <laughs> a hundred times over right so we don't know this when they're laying the cable right because they're burying the cable and they're literally taking out the sprinkler system every time they bury the cable around the house my wife i'm on a business trip my wife comes home she looks at the front yard and she goes paul it looked like someone took a massive beach ball and just shoved it under our grass <laughs> and she said the all the pipes had been cut and so the the water was blowing up our yard literally blowing up our it's yard like the bellagio she, yeah totally it was a fountain underneath the facade she runs inside she grabs a screwdriver she's 
like three months pregnant with our first. She runs out and people are looking at her. She is stabbing our front yard to relieve the pressure to take the water out of the yard. She said it's a gusher at that point. It's just spilling water out. She runs back inside, turns the water off. It took a year. It took a year to fix our sprinkler system because Media One was then bought by AT&T. The customer service people didn't get the handoff. It took a year, a year, because they had to get lawn service people out there, different techs. It wasn't working. The zones are off. Oh, my God. So we went back to DISH. I like, was, was <laughs> I was like, not one for the company. How is the cable? Yeah, yeah. I was like, there was, dude, I went back to DISH. I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like yeah, we went to DISH because I was like, we don't control this customer care. We just sell them boxes and equipment. So oh my God. it was, but the funny thing was they, so they, they, she cancels the order for the, the best part is it's not over. Like she cancels the order for the cable, but they didn't get the cancel order. So they come back out and lay the cable after the repair happened a year later oh, wow. and did it again, like did part of it again, like did like a section of it again. And my wife was literally running outside going, what are you doing? Like so anyway, that didn't take a year to fix, but it was just one of those stories where you're like, wow, that is that is that could have been really like damaging to your health. I love it. That was a great story. I'm I'm still laughing. <laughs> right. You can see the beach ball underneath the yard. I, right? that's, I, I think the yeah. the, the, the uh, image is just like the biggest it's like if an elephant was burrowing in your <laughs> yeah, yard. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Like a gopher water. And she only knew it was water because it was kind of like trickling out of the yeah. sides. And it's just totally taunting you too while I was doing that. So that's been great, Paul. We haven't got into a lot of finance stuff, but we have to have Paul back. We have to have Paul back, but this wow. has been amazing. Wow. No, no. Thank you, guys. Uh, it's been great. Yeah. We've actually learned a lot. We uh, we dug into a lot of stuff that you've done, talked about your, mm -hmm. your journey and where you've gone. Obviously, passion and purpose mean a lot to you. Family means yeah. a lot to you, but doing the right thing also means a lot to you. And that's a big thing for all of us as we're trying to do our business and get out there and make it happen. So adventure team let's get going up that mountaintop of success keep digging keep driving the only way to get there hard work and being smart let's go make it happen we're out of here cheers thank you guys